So recently I made a presentation on the decision making between superglottic airway devices and tracheal intubation. How do we make decisions in airway management? This presentation would be for anyone who's just wanting to, you know, hear, hear my opinion, I guess. I looked at a bunch of evidence, I compared different sources of evidence, and then we spoke about some of the processes in decision making and how I see these things. So let's jump straight in. Right at the beginning, you'll see I have a really cool quote here that says, pre-hospital airway management in trauma patients has always been a subject of debate among many professionals for a number of years. And that's because the literature is not very clear. Um, there's, many, there's many points, many people saying completely different things, um, and we're gonna dive more into exactly why that is, all right? So what's my background? Well, I have been born and brought up in South Africa. I was a paramedic in South Africa for about three to four years as an advanced life support paramedic intubating patients in the pre-hospital setting. And we have very limited resources. Sometimes you don't have a ventilator. Sometimes you, you know, struggle to get a monitor with a SATS probe. And it depends on where you are in the country. It depends on what resources you have, if you're private or government. I worked for government. Sometimes we had very limited resources that may or may not have changed. This is just when I was there. And so that made it very challenging to assess patients and treat patients and especially manage ventilated patients or perform an RSI in the pre-hospital setting when you may or may not have a ventilator. So we were advised not to RSI without a ventilator, um, but we would sometimes do long distance transfers with patients who were intubated and had been RSI. So there are lots of factors to consider. Then I moved to Qatar where I had all the ventilators, all the monitors, all the backup, all the resources you could possibly need. South Africa was a very resource limited place. I then moved to Qatar where I had unlimited resource. So I see a superglottic device similar to kind of how I see a spare tire. I wouldn't be driving around in a car if I didn't have a spare tire, if I didn't know it fitted properly, if I didn't know how to put it on the car. And as long as I knew it was working and functional, that then allows me to drive a car. So that's the same way how I see intubation and RSI and superglottic device. A superglottic device is my backup. A superglottic device is the thing I use when intubation doesn't work. Intubation isn't for every patient. RSI is not for every patient. A superglottic can be more effective, safer, and better. But when I am performing a RSI, my superglottic is like my spare tire. I'm not going to be driving around without it. So have you ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Well, the Dunning-Kruger effect is this graph, which I really have enjoyed or really come to enjoy a lot, where when we first start to intubate or when we first start to manage airways, we kind of know nothing but very quickly we gain a lot of confidence. So as you see at the top here, we have a lot of confidence, but really we know nothing. And so most practitioners, in my opinion, especially when we're students, um, if not even when we just qualify, we have a lot of confidence, but we have managed very few airways and likely have not managed a very complicated airway. So we feel like we have huge confidence and then we're just starting, we just start to RSI everybody. Um, and then we quickly run into problems. And so hopefully the point of this conversation is to have a better understanding of how we can make these decisions and what kind of risks and benefits are we taking, as well as the fact that we need to try and get over this peak of confidence so that we can get down to low confidence and slowly gain wisdom and experience. Airway management and airway decision making um, really comes with experience and we have experience or we gain experience when we make mistakes. So what are the lesson objectives for this presentation? So we're going to talk about why. Why is decision making regards regarding advanced area management important? What does the literature say? How do we make good decisions? And then we can practice. So let's jump straight in. So why is this important? So as you can see here on the first study, which is Lucky et al, 2015, they assessed um, paramedics in London who were on the road and intubating patient. They found that a large percentage of these intubations were not done effectively. On the arrival of a paramedic doctor team, there was 100% success of airway management using RSI. So there was a high rate of failure, high rate of putting the tube in the esophagus or putting the tube too, too deep or not even putting in a tube at all. So, or not even putting on oxygen. So there were lots of really critical issues with that. I think there was quite a large study. I can't exactly remember the numbers, but I'll put them up. So the numbers didn't look good for intubation, but if you looked at the numbers for superglottic airway device, there was a much higher rate 
of success. So we need to ask why. If you want to get good at whatever you're doing, nurse, doctor, paramedic, whatever you're studying, ask why. Always ask why so we can understand. So why did they have a low failure rate of intubation? Well, they didn't have drugs to RSI. So they don't have paralytics and induction agents to facilitate effective airway management. And so therefore they were trying to put a endotracheal tube into someone who is still kind of like breathing and moving and it's just I've done it myself we can sometimes um, back in the day we'd use like deep sedation so midazolam and morphine or domicum and morphine and that's not ideal it makes intubating a lot harder or these muscles are a lot more tense and your view is a whole lot worse they also don't intubate very often so if you're not doing a skill often you're not going to be good at it that is really important. I was saying that I've come up, or I might have read it somewhere, but odds are I probably made it, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, is that you are best at whatever you do most often. So if you are putting in superglottic devices all the time, or if that's your main thing, then do the main thing, because that's what you're best at. Don't start doing something else if it's not something you do every day, or if it's out of your normal, you're gonna be less good at it. So we need to balance our skill versus the benefit versus the risk. Jiang et al, probably saying that wrong, 2016, was a systematic review of 1,450 studies. So it's a lot of evidence on airway management. Only 10 were of any quality, which shows you how much quality evidence there is. In this study, they compared advanced airway management versus basic airway management. So in the advanced airway management, there was 17,000 patients. And in the basic airway management, there were 67,000 patients. So that is quite a big study. They looked at out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They found that patients who were in out-of-hospital out of cardiac arrest had a decreased chance of survival rate when advanced airway management was used. So that's, that's a big study and that's saying that basic airway management was actually more effective than advanced airway management. And so we know that there's lots of factors that go into this. How long was the recess? What was wrong with the person? And so that's why when they looked at 1,450 studies, only 10 were of high quality. You know they're taking only really high quality studies. And so there are lots of confounders potentially in that sort of thing. But really what is happening here is that when we are in cardiac arrest and then we are focusing on compressions and then we move away from compressions to airway management because now we want to intubate, it doesn't actually improve survival rate. It kind of just changes the way we ventilate. So if there is something that's wrong with them that's specifically airway like around or like let's say it's drowning or primary edema or something where we need really good airway management that's a different story but other than that once we take the focus off high high quality compressions and good ventilations just basic airway good chest rise then we're going to lose the sight i remember walking into a hospital one time as a paramedic and the person who was doing compressions stopped compressions to help the doctor tie the tube down so there was such a focus on the intubation and not on the cpr cpr is more important so then the next study by Carnet et al. 2021, the third study, they did a systematic review of 99 studies, which, which included over half a million patients over a period of 30 years. So over 30 years at over a million patients, comparing basic airway management, superglottic airway management, and endotracheal tube or advanced endotracheal tube airway management, intubation, um, in cardiac arrest and in trauma, there was no differences in ROSC, in survival to hospital, to 30-day survival, to survival or discharge out of hospital. There was no improvement out of any of these patients. So whether they used basic airway or superglottic or intubation, it didn't improve the outcome. So when we look at trying to decide what is better, we need to be like, well, it, it, it doesn't make as big of a difference as we think as long as what we're doing works. So if you're really good at basic area management, then do basic area. If you're really good at intubation, then intubate. And realize that we don't manage airways, we manage patients. What we do to the airway affects the patient, what we do to the patient affects the airway. Cool, so how do we make decisions? Well, largely it comes down to, like I said, is benefit versus risk or risk versus benefit. That's always how I manage a, a, a patient and an airway. If I believe that the risk of RSIing someone in the pre-hospital pre setting outweighs, outweighs the benefit, then I'll always just go to hospital because there's very, very few patients who you have to RSI now or they will die. It's just a really small population. I'd love for you guys to comment below all the patients you think need to be RSI'd right now or they will die. And it's largely got to do with a like swelling airway or cannot ventilate, cannot um, intubate or can, sorry, cannot oxygenate, cannot ventilate due to some sort of thing happening in the mouth. Um, other than that, it's really 
so many times people people get RSI done, it's really not that necessary. Um, if you're talking about a head injury, uh, that's still, I sort of disagree. I'll talk about it later. Um, does a head injury need to be intubated? No, my opinion. So supraglottic device versus intubation, which is better? So a supraglottic device only fails in two patients. Well, in two situations. When the provider has improper technique and improper sizing. Other than that, a supraglottic device will work. There's a very small population where it will not work. In that population, a intubation probably won't work either if be very difficult. When is intubation better? Well, so a, pa a patient goes to theater or whatever the case and they get intubated. So if we can intubate someone, how do we decide which is better or which is worse? So intubation takes a lot of skill, a lot of practice, a lot more drugs, a lot more um, teamwork. It requires you to take a lot of risk in terms of stopping someone from breathing to then RSI them, to then hopefully put a tube down a little small hole, which can be very challenging. And in the pre-hospital setting, we should always be expecting a difficult airway, in my opinion. It saved me a couple of times. And so we can't say which is better. It depends on why you're using it. It depends on who you are. It depends on where you are. It depends on what you're doing, what your resources are, what your skills are, what does the patient need. It's just we are not cooking bread. We are not following a recipe. We're not baking. So you can't say, well, if this happens, then that. If that happens, then this we can't have recipes for airway management, unfortunately, as much as that would probably save lives. So the evidence is limited. It is limited to say which is best. I, I don't think there is one is best over the other. It depends on where you are, what kind of team you're working in, how much training and energy do you spend doing it. So what does this all mean and why? So when we look at people who have really high failure rates of intubation, it's very likely because they don't intubate very often they don't have much training in intubation or they don't have the proper equipment or drugs. If you have the proper drugs, the proper training, if you have enough exposure to it, then you can get to a place where you have a very high success rate in intubation. But if you have low exposure to patients who need to be intubated, if you don't have the correct drugs, and if you aren't in a system where there is a high performing system where you are running training and there's like high quality training and development and um, reviews of studies and um, CPD, so continued professional development in airway management, then you are going to have high rates of failure. And in those situations, we then shouldn't be RSIing because that is not the safest thing for a patient. So let's try some practice. Let's just see, it might be a bit strange over a YouTube video, but. Maybe I should go live and do it on live. Let me know on, in the comments below if you'd like me to do stuff like this live on YouTube. I would be open to it. I've never done it before, but anyway. So let's practice. So you have a 40-year-old female, cardiac arrest at home, suspected AMI, myocardial infarction, airway, no airway movement, breathing, no breathing, circulation, no pulse, ECG rhythms, V, fib. Why don't you pause it now, take a look, and make up your own decision. Or make up your own mind, then we can continue. So, in my opinion, so this patient is in cardiac arrest. We think she's had a, a heart attack or an MI. There's no breathing, no pulse, and she's in VF. How do we manage this, this patient's airway? Well, so in, in, in my opinion, the airway is not what is most important in this patient. We need to be doing, well, we need to start high quality compressions and we need to do early defibrillation. That's it. We don't need to be trying to work out if we're gonna do a supraglottic or intubation or BVM right now. What he needs or what she needs is high quality CPR and early defib. Once we've done that, we can do basic airway management. If basic airway management doesn't work, then put in a supraglottic. Intubation takes time. Sometimes you have to stop CPR. A LMA or a IGEL or some sort of supraglottic will do the job. Number two, 35 year old male, unconscious at home, lying on bedroom floor, suspected multiple drug overdose. Snoring sounds from the airway, four breaths per minute. So a bit slow, deep, normal breath sounds, saturation 80% on room air, heart rate a bit fast, BP normal, ECG sinus tacky. You can pause here to have a look. So in my opinion, they have taken some, some drugs. They've always done a drug overdose or unconscious. They look like they're pretty stable, tachycardia, blood pressure is normal, sinus tacky. What does their airway need? Their airway needs to be maintained and protected. So if you are able to assess, so they are not breathing sufficiently, they're breathing slow and they are quite uptunded, there's a good chance that you can just place an LMA or place an ET tube and not even have to give them anything because they've taken a multiple drug overdose. They're probably very deeply asleep. You could probably put in an LMA. If not, put them on oxygen, see if their saturation comes up 
put them lateral and transport the hospital. So would being would putting them lateral on their side, putting a nasal prong or a non-rebreather on them, letting their ma making sure that their saturation improves, and then you could take them to hospital. You can even trial a dose of naloxone. Uh, remember, intramuscular or intranasally is better. When we're going to go IV, we must give like 10% of the dose. If we're not quite sure what the multiple drug overdose is, then obviously you're not sure what's going on. I'm trying to get some history. But otherwise, does he need to be intubated? No. If you can maintain these saturations above 94 on oxygen and you can keep them lateral to avoid aspiration, he does need intubation. Can you intubate him? Yeah. Can you put in a, sub a subaglotic? Probably. Can you basic area management? You can. So you see this patient and the previous patient, either three is appropriate. Completely. Next one. 55-year-old male, unconscious, pedestrian vehicle accident, suspected traumatic brain injury with chest trauma. So airway, gargling sounds, breathing, 20 breaths per minute, shallow breaths, decreased breath sounds on the right, saturation, 90% on room air, circulation, heart rate stable, blood pressure a bit low, sinus tachycardia, you can pause it to have a look yourself. So airway is gargling, so it's unprotected. He's breathing quickly, he's breathing shallow, there's decreased breath sounds, there's trauma to his chest and to his head. Heart rate of 130, blood pressure is a bit low, sinus tachycardia. So his BP is below his heart rate. So if you look at the shock index, I made a video about it, I think it's that side. And so if his heart rate is above his systolic blood pressure, we have some sort of bleeding. So he has bleeding into his chest, decreased breath sounds, tell me that it's probably a hemothorax. Does he need to be intubated? Well, he's breathing quite quick. If we put him on oxygen, he'll probably be fine. If we RSI him like this, we're going to cause problems. He's in shock, he's bleeding, he's hypovolemic, paralyzing, stopping their breathing, breathing for them, drops their blood pressure. And so can we put him on nasal prongs, put him on a um, scoop stretcher, put him on his side and take him to hospital? You probably could. Could you do a delayed sequence intubation and put, or a um, rapid sequence airway, which is when we paralyze someone and we put a um, alamein or a subaglotic, or could we RSI? So we could resuscitate him to RSI, which would be better. Uh, it's, it's really hard to say. The evidence does not say intubation or RSI is the best thing for head injuries. It's not. We don't want them to vomit. We don't want them to gag. We don't want them to aspirate. But it depends on what you have and where you are and what your resources are and what you normally do. And so, like I said, there's so many um, fa like factors to influence how we should manage an airway. What would I do? Depends on where I am, what resources I have. If I am quite far from hospital and I am struggling to manage his ventilation, I would probably just RSI him on scene as long as I'm confident that he's still not bleeding and he's not going to go into cardiac arrest. The three things we want to avoid when we're going to RSI someone is if they are hypoxic, if they are hypovolemic, or if they are in an acidosis, these patients are very risky. He is hypoxic right now and he is hypovolemic or he's borderline hypertensive, so I will be very careful with my drug dosages. So there we go. So guys, if there's anything else you'd like to talk about or any other comments or questions or queries at the bottom, please chat at the bottom. I'd love to start a conversation about what you guys think of my viewpoint. This is a South African sort of viewpoint. Would be interesting to see what you think. Thanks for your time. Bye for now.